Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Interwoven from the Weave. My name's Adam Roxby and this time around we've got three fascinating interviews with female entrepreneurs. So let's not wait any longer and tell you what's in today's episode. Well, James had a conversation with a practitioner of sophrology, and if you don't know what that is, then you're going to want to stick around for that. We also have a conversation with a business owner making bespoke interactive training for companies. She shares insights into the challenges and what sets her business apart. I give a quick rundown of a film event I attended at the Colchester Arts Centre. And the final conversation we have is with a passionate entrepreneur creating school and workwear, but also has ambitions to corner the market in making garments for those with physical and mental health challenges. So let's not delay and get going with our first conversation between James Cracknell and Sandrine Singleton Perrin. So I'm really, really pleased to welcome uh, Sandrine Singleton Perrin to the podcast. She's a sophrologist. For those people out there that are going, what? What's a sophrologist? I'll go and give my introduction to this program. So Sandrine did, came to the Essex University and she came to our Essex Startups um, weekly meeting. And she did a, this particular session with us where she introduced this particular program, this, this, this idea, this concept. And I found it really impactful and I found it really engaging aging to work with. I found the whole kind of process really enjoyable, but also quite revealing. And it also gave me a very sort of an unusual insight into teams and development and work and things like that. And I wanted to capture a bit of that. And so that's why we've invited her onto the podcast. And we want to go through a, a little bit about the explanation around that and just understand the background, the way that it could be applied, and ultimately what we could be doing within the community to bring it to entrepreneurs, to those people that are really going through this, if you like, the hurdles and the barriers and the pains of running and starting a business. So welcome, Sandrine. Welcome to our Interwoven podcast and welcome to the Weave community. Tell us, first off, just a little bit about how you got involved, your background and what you kind of, how you arrived at this particular area of work. And also just give us an overview, if you like, of what sophrology really is. Thanks, James. Thank you for having me. So um, how I came to sophrology. So before I became a sophrologist, I was a university lecturer, teacher at um, Essex, and I spent this teaching in higher education. And I had to stop because I basically hit burnout to, to make it um, very um, quick. And at the time, I didn't know I was going through burnout because some of the signs of burnout are quite insidious and a lot of people do not don't know. Um, so it's maybe something we can talk about and how can sophrology help. So um, I left the university in a state of mental and physical exhaustion. I'd lost my sense of self, actually, and the enthusiasm and the, you know, and, and, um, I felt pretty miserable and quite worthless because I couldn't cope with the work I'd been doing for 25 years because it got, it was too much. And all I knew is I had to get out. I couldn't continue. Otherwise, I was going to, you know, I was going to burn and crash and, and collapse. So I resigned, but I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I didn't seek help. Um, I mean, luckily, I had a supportive husband and he supported me. And I said to him, look, I just cannot do this anymore. So I made the decision to resign. And luckily for me, I came across this method called sophrology when I was in France and I just came across a series of articles who, which explained um, what sophrology was. So just to give you in a nutshell what, how we could define it very quickly, it's a simple, adaptable safe, very gentle method for physical, emotional and mental well-being. And it was designed and developed by a neuropsychiatrist called Professor Alfonso Caicedo in the 1960s. And he basically put together everything that was about well-being, good living, that was available at the time. He condensed, you know, the, the kind of Western relaxation techniques and also medicine, what was, you know, was known at the time, with Eastern approaches. So basically, sophrology is a mix between Western and Eastern approaches in well-being and self-development. 
Okay. And as I said to you, you worked because it was a psychiatrist, you worked with people um, with PTSD. So there were war veterans. And he was really interested in human consciousness and how you could alter their experience of life and get them into, you know, into normal life again. And he realized that you could do that naturally. And you could foster positivity within them, though despite the traumas and, and suffering, he was able to um, strengthen and just awaken the positivity in them. Uh, instead of going back to the trauma itself, uh, it was about you know, coming back to the body, creating safety in the body and seeking what's positive within us. You know, this positive, yeah. these kind of dormant powers and resources that we've all got, despite what life can throw at us. So that's how it came about. So what do we do in sophology? So as you, you experience it, James, and your team, it's really a mix of very gentle physical movements, breathing techniques, relaxation techniques, but also mental imagery or visualization. So it's really a kind of synchron synchronizing all these things together. And it's really about the mind-body connection and getting that to work for our own advantage, you know, to promote optimal health and optimal well-being. Um, so obviously I'll give you a little taster at the end so that you can, because I think so far is something that you need to experience. You know, I can lecture, I can tell you more about it, but essentially that's what it is. In terms of when you're practicing this, is it something that you do, you have to be in the room present or is it going to be online or is the actual approach malleable in that regard? Yeah, it's totally adaptable. OK, so it can be done pretty much anywhere, to be honest. So it can be done at work. So what we're going to do is so you can do it in your in your chair if you're in front of your desk, you know, and you need a bit of a you need a five minute break. So I'll give you some exercises for you to do and for you to take away. You can do that. Yeah. As part of a group setting, you can do that online. So, I mean, I work in person and online with individuals, but also in groups. So it lends itself to any, any kind of setting. That's the thing. It is quite versatile. And what I like about this particular method is that it's quite inclusive. So everybody, you're human, you're alive, you can do sophrology. It doesn't matter what your status is in your company, it doesn't matter what gender, what age, what physical condition, what your belief system is. You know, it is really inclusive and it's about this universal need to be to feel well and to, to be happy and to live the best life we can. And doing that in a very accessible way with really simple exercises. And the other thing I think that is very important because people think that well-being, social well-being with, you know, taking an hour and a half of your time to go and do yoga and do meditation. And all these things are great, but, you know, people are time poor. They haven't got um, that time to dedicate to their well-being, which is a shame, but it's a reality. And so what I think the uniqueness of sophrology is you can, she use and do just five minutes of it and you will feel a difference it will make a difference how you feel um, and you don't have any equipment you don't need all you need is you and a chair just go back to that kind of outcome of what people would experience if they partake in a particular session what's the normal reaction for people when they've experienced sophrology what's their kind of mental state after they've experienced it and is it something you have to do every day consistently or is it something that you can do as and when you need it you could do as as and when you need it and you will feel an instantaneous effect you know you'd be better um but obviously like anything else or everything else you know repetition is key you know the regular the more you know regularly you do it the better so it doesn't have to be every day for a half an hour as i said i think for me the kind of this notion of pausing and coming back to the body because we are disconnected from our bodies, all of us in, in our societies. And that from that disconnection come loads of problems. Um, so you can't really know how you're really feeling if you're disconnected with your body and you're just up here all the time. So I think frequency rather than duration is, is key. When people do it the first time, they're just really amazed because they think, I've got a body, you know, and I've, I've realized I've got tension in my, you know, in the back of my, my lower back, I've noticed. So it's really about increasing body awareness. Because the more aware you are of your sensations and how you feel, then you can remedy, you can find what, you know, you can be in touch with what you need in the moment. Is there a type of person or type of people that are more receptive to it? And are there people where you're looking at it thinking you could really benefit from this? Like you say, it's inclusive, it's open, it's everything there. But do you find as you're talking to people, people are becoming kind of a, there's a, a reticence for certain people to actually not participate? If I think about the clients, even, you know, in group situation, you've got a majority of women. OK, and that's why I wanted to talk to you about men, because I think there's a genuine need 
um, and why that is we can talk about. But so in terms of my personal experience, I've been working with mainly women of all ages, 30 plus, who know that something is about to give. They're like I said, on the verge, they're on the road to burnout. They're not quite sure what's happening, but they, they're at the end of their tether. And if they can do something about their well-being, they will, you know, they will collapse. And they're usually people from, you know, the caring profession, health professionals, teachers, but also people in businesses, um, self-employed. I had somebody who was a lawyer. Uh, and obviously, it's not just about work. It's, you know, life. And so people who have demanding jobs, you know, businesses, and they've got demanding family life because they've got kids. We've got, you know, the, this person, had, they had three children to them with, you know, learning difficulties. And it's, a, you know, you just have to juggle everything. And, you know, we're not meant to be under stress constantly. And when you don't have time to recover, to rest and recover, and the worst case is that you know, the complete burnout when your body is literally out of fuel and one day you can't get out of bed. So obviously my work is trying to not get people there and not feel that they're weak or lazy because you know they can't they've got this thing they can't cope and i think that's one of the signs of burnout that we don't talk about is the stigma and the shame um because you get to a stage where you're no longer enthusiastic and you're no longer efficient you, you just can't do your job as well as before and you compare yourself with others you think i can't cope and therefore i'm weak with psychology, we try to reverse that. You know, you can't change life circumstances. Sometimes, you know, you've got a busy job, you've got a busy family life, you've got circumstances that you can't, can't change. So what is it you do when you're in that position? You can't leave your kids, you know, you can't leave your care, you know, parents, or, you know, what do you do? And for me, it's really about helping people finding really practical ways, really easy, simple that they can embed in their lives just to help them cope with, you know, with, with life. I go swimming. Now, the other thing I do is, is I go swimming, right? And before I used to kind of do my 40 lengths nonstop, you know, like going fast. Now, what I do is I do 10 and then I pause, catch my breath for two minutes and I can do my other 10 or whatever. You know, so it's kind of integrating these pauses and you go faster and you go, you know, you, you're more enduring, you're more, um, what's what, you're more resilient because yeah. you can, you can last longer. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's about, you know, being resilient in the long term. You know, and I think that's a really interesting intro to this whole idea of getting us away from this concept of Taylor-esque time, time, time spent in routines, constantly working away, and the inefficiency that that breeds through tiredness, and particularly in today's world where creativity, innovation, those things at the end of the day are the defining elements of being human right? AI and technologies are replicating tasks and all the rest of it. And in a way that should give us as humans the ability to be more creative, more intuitive, more agile, responsive to our environments and aware and all of those different characteristics. Now, if we're exhausted, it's really hard to be that kind of aware person. And I think what we've got to do is this kind of nonsensical mi mindset of, of entrepreneurism, which says we've got to work 60, 70 hours a week on our business, and we're going to be stressed out to the hilts and do this, that and the other. And I know that there's a lot of people out there probably going, well, I do that and I do that. And actually, working like this, where you embed some kind of practice that gives you that moment of space between the problem and the solution and the way that you want yourself to be embedded in. I think that's a really important kind of message within that. In my clumsy way, I kind of alluded to the fact that men are not the natural customers to this kind of process, but I actually think men really need to wake up to this whole idea of being much more attuned to their own mental and physical environment. They work in a particular way, and I think that they struggle with that kind of combination. So if we're going to change the mindset of men to be more respect or responsive to this, what do we think? What do you think the process should be? How do we need to get men to be much better attuned to this kind of discipline, this kind of thought process? Right. That's a, that's a hard one. But I think it's to recognize, acknowledge that they're not feeling their best, that they might feel anxious, stressed out, and there's nothing wrong with that. And just remove the stigma around that. That it's not, in a way, it's not about gender. You know, it's about being human and accepting that you're vulnerable. And one of the reasons why I like about sophrology, and I'm coming back to this inclusiveness, is that 
It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're your age, you're a man, you're a woman, you're a human being. And how can you just live a fulfilling life, you know, and, and remove the difficulties and, and, and be together? And when you work with a sophrologist, what like it, the term we use for that relationship between the sophrology and the client is an alliance. So it's not about me telling you what to do and I watch what you do. It's an alliance. We allies, we work together. That's where the sophrology will practice with you. We do the exercises together. And I think that changes the kind of dynamic. I think one of the sort of the challenges that we have when we try to build a community is that sometimes men don't see that community advantage. They're very individualistic and very isolationist in what they're kind of positioning themselves in. And the reality is, is actually communities are really timeless. I mean, we're, you know, we've been living in communities since we were human beings and ultimately we've had roles and functions. And like you say, there's a kind of challenge as well, isn't there, with men and, and the way that you, you know, you quite rightly say that they've lost almost that male identity, that traditional role model kind of environment. And I think that's fine because the world changes and society changes. And I think we're normalizing now to become a much more inclusive and a, a sort of kind of egalitarian approach to relationships and to the way we're doing it, which I think it's really, again, a very positive thing. Maybe we're still not doing it in business. Maybe there's still a load of it still missing. I mean, there's still statistics in business, which are horrendous about exclusion from women, from, from funding operations, from CEO board memberships or whatever it is, there's still a minority presence within that environment. And I think that still needs to fundamentally shift and change. So we have to kind of get within that area. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in the dynamics of the conversations that we can have so that men feel included and inclusive of this kind of therapy, because I want those messages to go out to people to say, this is a great space to actually reconnect with being human, as you quite rightly said, is that connection of understanding. And, and like you say, vulnerability is not weakness. So these are metaphors or, or heuristics that can go into that particular space and actually modify people's perceptions and make them more open and attuned to this particular kind of idea. So I think that's something. So I think it's kind of picking up on those words in that sort of area of, de of yeah. development. Another thing that might be worthwhile men mentioning, and you were saying about the differentiation between sophrology and other sort of types of, you know, mindfulness practices, is that people as assume that, you know, meditation is not for them because they can't, you know, just, you just sit with your thoughts uh, or, you know, you have to empty your mind and this is not what it is. And in a way, the, the advantage of sophrology is that if you're not a born meditator or you know you're a bit you know meditation is a bit elusive is that because we we use the body we use the breath and you know you're guided into doing things so you're constantly in a way following instructions so you don't really have time or you know, your mind has got less time to kind of wander off to other things and so you're more connected to your body so to go back to the men thing in, in so we don't actually it's not a talking therapy so we're not going to delve into the root causes of problems anxiety and things it's just that how are you feeling in the moment and i'm going to ask you this question jane in a minute say like, how do you feel in your body how you know are you, you know, feeling tired you've got tension it's you know so it's in the moment so you, you we, we deal with the person as they're feeling. Obviously, they will come with some kind of issue, but it's really about, okay, what is it you're feeling at the moment? How, 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 and how would you, would you like to feel? And then we, you know, and then we do it and we, we do stuff. The other thing as well, I think that is important to understand about sophrology, it's not just a relaxation um, practice. It's not about being calm and being relaxed. It, you know, we use relaxation techniques, but it's really about acting in the world and finding your your rightful place and how to live in a way that is aligned to your values. And, you know, there's a lot of work around the future, around values, but it always involves, you know, it always involves the body. So um, it's not just about positive mindset. It's not just thinking it, it's feeling it. So everything you do in sophrology is about coordinating breath, body and intention. I think that whole kind of it's being not just about relaxation, but about preparation or, or something within that that area. Is it used in the field of sports at all? Is it is it used in that world as well? It's used in sports competitions. Um, I was going to say the French rugby team um, <laughs> used it. Obviously, it didn't serve them very well. That's <laughs> 
I think it served them pretty well, to be fair. I think they they they, they were in the, uh, you said, a pretty tough group to get the hell out of, really, didn't they, at that point? Yeah. So, yeah, like you said, it's mental preparation. You know, it, you know, obviously there's a physical training, but how you, your perspective on, on how you're going to perform, uh, you know, the mental or focus, the mental preparation is key as well. So that is used yeah, in, in sports. It's used in the corporate world. It's used, I, I think I told you about this, um, in the forces. And my first articles about this colonel in the French French you know um, special forces who was saying how we use sophology to help him do his job and I can't think of any more stressful job you can do and you know he explained how some techniques would you know would really make the difference in staying grounded resilient uh, and making the right decisions the conversations are getting better and I think that's that's good and I think we need to continue with that level of conversations and discussions around these kind of things and I think putting it in the context of like you say where it's been in with sports so and the army and in the corporate world and all the rest of it is actually again sort of opening up that kind of inclusivity area and it becomes a good part of that practice if you like so one of the things that I'm very keen on in terms of like team development and working with teams of people and things is to embed processes and practices within this so if i had a team of 10 people or whatever that i wanted to bring together on a regular basis is that 15 20 minutes at the start of a particular team meeting bring in this piece of practice and then ultimately see the benefits afterwards uh, on, on a regular basis i think you would start seeing a difference not just the, the individual would feel the difference but you as a team and obviously the, the you know the the practice can be tailored to whatever the team requires whatever the goals are whatever resources you need to strengthen yeah there's a lot of work and, and that's the thing that's the kind of work i'm interested in to facilitate yeah the other thing I noticed when I experienced it that one time at the university is that there's a strength in the language that you used. It was a very clean language. And I mean, I imagine that's a very deliberate taking you on a journey, leaning you through into that kind of area. And I th- found that very kind of interesting as well, that put new emphasis on the people in the room and that team connection. And I think as well, if you've got a large team or if you've got just a smallish team, I think, but you've got an agile team of people, maybe that they've not worked together before, but maybe that they're in the process of developing a, a new product. They want to put together a sprint. They want to put together something at the end of the day, which is going to try hopefully lead to a product or an outcome of some description but that starting bit of bringing people together and actually getting them to come together in that kind of framework where they can start to build those bonds I think that's quite an interesting interpretation Mm -hmm. or a bit of movement I know from our perspective when we work with students and when we work with businesses and put teams together um, for sprints and often they they're people have never worked together before then it's actually quite an interesting almost team formation and I'm very interested about this kind of idea of team formation at the start of kind of sprints and things like that because I see that as a quite an interesting role particularly if you're thinking about what you want to get out of it which at the end of the day is a piece of creative exploration around a new challenge or a product or some piece of delivery that you're aiming to help a business to actually uncover. Just tell us a little bit more about your ambitions for this, for your business, for where you want things to go. Is sophrology well known in the UK or is it better known in Europe? There are more of us in the UK, but it's still emerging. But, it, you know, there's kind of, it's kind of emerging and it's, you know, gaining momentum. It is popular or certainly well-known in French-speaking countries, France, Switzerland, um, also in some South American countries. In terms of your aspirations for your business, are there ways that it could grow, scale in terms of technologies and practicalities around that kind of stuff? Is there things that it could be, that it could grow in that regard for you and your business? Yeah. I think for me, I think realistically, if I want, you know, to grow the business or make, um, you know, any kind of decent living out of it, it will have to be, you know, working with programs that are online or, you know, packaged programs um, or doing some kind of hybrid programs where, you know, people kind of, you know, do things on their own. They're, they're guided step by step, you know, this kind of video material, but also maybe, you know, like, live training or you know t- when you come in then you you know you, you ask people if they've got you know any any issues or you know, working with you know groups I mean I, I love working with groups rather than one-to-one um sessions I've got to say so that's, that's probably from my teaching background I think this like facilitating groups is definitely 
there. My challenge is really to know, you know, A, who my niche is. I've still haven't worked that one out. And how I spread and how, you know, I mean, how do I make a living out of being this? And um, I haven't found the answer just yet. I think every business has this kind of moment of realisation they, that they, they bring something to um, the world, whether it's a technology or a skill or a passion, a practice or whatever. And then the, the question is, how do I make that work for me for to create a living, to create something? And I think that's where technology and partnerships and potentially those sorts of um, affiliations can actually start to change the dynamics of the way the business then starts to work. Niching is always an interesting one because niching in terms of creating a real relevance to that particular sector that, or that particular area, the best place to niche is the, where there is that environment where you, you've already got an established network, you've already got the authority, you've got the credibility, um, you've got the, the audience in, in a way and you're approaching something from that area. So it becomes mm. that much more relevant and specific to them and you've got that acknowledged presence already then I think it becomes a, a much easier inroad into that area it's one of the challenges is when people say oh, I want to segment over here but I actually don't know anybody over there because the segment mm-hmm. could be as big as you want that segment to be so yeah. ultimately you could be as lost as if you were taking on the whole world anything that creates relevance and anything that creates opportunity and low-hanging fruit to actually get you into that particular niche is a really important sort of kind of first step but the other thing I always say to people again is niching is not limitation niching is about validation and authority and you build it within a niche and that will actually then allow you when your niche grows to expand into areas where you wouldn't normally be seen but coming from a position of strength not from a position of one of many or a small dot in a large framework you're actually built that and you've arrived there with people going have you heard about or have you seen this person have you seen that business have you done that whatever so it becomes that more viral way of actually then starting to grow those particular areas the challenge is is you've got to work in that niche and and become dominant within that particular area and own that space if you like and that's really one of the challenges for a lot of businesses whether you're an acupuncturist or whether you're a sophrologist you've got to kind of find that area where your relevance can actually open the doors and you your networks can really start to elevate you within that particular space. Yeah. Okay, so um, well, I thought we'd do a really kind of mini software session. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you a couple of things so that I can um, tailor a little session. It will be a very short one. So just, A, how are you feeling now and how you would, would you like to feel for the rest of the day and evening? Okay, um, how I feel now, um, I've got a slight aching back because I've been sitting too long. Um, I did a uh, workshop this morning, and so I did get a, get up at lunchtime and wander around, but I didn't get out with the dogs, which is a bit frustrating. So I'm going to do that after this call, I think. So I'm a bit kind of tense in the back and a bit sore at the base of my spine. Voice is a bit sore as well because I've done a lot of talking today, so it's quite nice just to stop okay. and listen for a, for a change. Mentally, I'm kind of in that... T- moment where I'm realizing we're moving into December and I'm actually kind of quite excited about certain things that are finishing off to give us that break and actually enjoy some time with the family and uh, and the rest so that's kind of so there's an excitement about where where we're going with things as well okay that's 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 interesting because we could work on that on that future Good. so you're talking about the exciting things in terms of work not the exciting idea. things in terms of the weave so we've got lots of different ideas fermenting away and we've got different programs um there's some content that we're writing so i like writing so there's some stuff there again which is really interesting writing about um, techniques different creative techniques like rich picturing and things like that so there's still kind of lots of things bits of content creative stuff going on okay. um and how would you like to feel any particular feeling you don't have to it's now sort of like 10 to 3 i'd like to be in the process of just coming to the end of the day kind of mindset where i'm kind of reflecting upon what we've done over the course of the day rather than actually be sort of up for a new piece of work or whatever so like i said i want to go out with the dogs after this and go for a wander and do all of that kind of stuff all right since you said that you've been sitting you've been sitting do you, do you mind working standing then no no not at all right i'll tell you what we're going to do 
So I'm going to show you first. I'm going to explain so whoever is listening to this can actually do it as well. Um, so we're going to work standing. If people are not feeling, you know, fit standing, they can still work and do the same thing, but seated. So we're going to do, we're just going to do a shoulder pump. So I'm going to show you first, James, okay. and then we'll, our guide you swim, we'll do it together. So make fists of both our hands and our arms by our sides. Okay. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes, if that's okay. And with your eyes closed, you're going to take a breath in, hold the breath. And as you're holding the breath, all you're doing is just moving your shoulders up and down. OK, so it can be a gentle pumping of the shoulders or it can be a very vigorous. So if you've got backache, just be gentle, you know, just adapt, listen to your body. We'll do that twice. Then uh, we'll pause, important pause where we just notice the sensations. I will then guide you through a very quick body scan where you bring your attention to various parts of the body. You don't need to remember because I will guide you through it. And since we've been talking about stress and burnout, we'll do another exercise where we tend to the whole body. OK, so you can put your arms up you know, above your head or just in front of you or just by your side. It doesn't really matter. The idea is you breathe in. Hold the breath and you just tense your whole body from head to toe. Again, choose, apply the right amount of tension. And we'll do that. We'll do just that once. Again, pause. Okay. And then I will invite you to find your seat, close your eyes, and we'll do a very short visualization. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. Okay? Okay, cool. So if we're ready, and whoever is listening, so Dandy, okay, you might want to look where you are in your room, just see where your body is positioned in this familiar place where you are. Mm -hmm. And then when you're ready, you can close your eyes and start focusing inwards, maybe starting noticing sensations with your eyes closed, noticing your breath, your natural breath, changing it in any way. And just become aware of the uprightness of your body. Your body upright between the sky and the earth. And we're going to start with our shoulder pump. So in your own time, just making fists with both your hands, taking a breath in. And while you're holding your breath, just start pumping your shoulders up and down, just choosing the right intensity. And when you need to breathe out, breathe out through the mouth, release your breath, release the fists. And just notice how you're feeling. Just any sensations anywhere in your body, in your shoulders, neck, your breath. And just let's repeat this a second time. So making fists, breathing in, holding the breath. And if we're holding the breath, let's pump our shoulders up and down. Being aware of that movement. Just really choosing the right amount. Pumping. And then when you need to breathe out, releasing the breath, releasing the arms and the hands. And keeping our eyes closed, we're just taking a few seconds to notice our sensations. And sensations can be a change in temperature, it can be a tingling. It can be tension we had noticed, just really noticing and observing what's happening now without judgment, just being curious. And then very gently, I'm going to invite you to bring your attention to your head and face. Just noticing any sensations there, what's happening inside. Just allowing your brain to just rest for the next few seconds. Nothing to plan, nothing to anticipate. Just allowing the brain to rest with each out-breath as if it was a muscle. See your forehead, your eyes, temples, cheeks, jaw, just allowing the jaw to enclench, your mouth, your teeth. Your ears, and become aware of the back of your head, your neck, your throat, your shoulders, just allowing the shoulders to relax and soften 
and fall away from the ears, your arms, forearms, your hands, fingers, just allowing this whole area from the top of your neck all the way down to your fingertips just to soften and relax. Then moving your attention up to your chest, to your back, the upper back. Just allowing all the muscle there to release, relax with each out breath. Maybe noticing or sensing the natural movement of your lungs as you breathe at your own pace. Allowing the shoulder blades to soften. And become aware of your whole of your back from the top of your neck all the way down to the base of your spine. Just imagining all the little muscles on either side of the spine to soften and relax with each out breath. Just breathing in, breathing out in the back. And shifting your focus to your abdominal area, your belly. Again, using your out breath to allow your belly to be soft. Just sensing and imagining all the internal organs just working in perfect harmony deep inside. And awareness of your lower body from your hips all the way down to your feet and your toes. Just noticing the tension or enough energy to keep you upright. Nothing more, nothing less. And then just taking a few seconds just to sense that connection with the ground below you. So your shoes, your feet in contact with the floor. Just feeling supported and held by the ground. And then with the next breath, just become aware of your whole body. Your whole body standing your whole body from head to toe, here and now. Maybe you sing the breath, your natural breath, the quality of your breath. And then we're going to do just one more physical exercise, a 10 cent release. So let's take a breath out through the mouth. Then take a deep breath in. Hold your breath, and as you're holding your breath, you just tense your whole body from head to toe, including your arms, your face, your back, your tummy, your legs, your feet. And then when you need to breathe out, just release everything. Release the breath, release the muscles. Just allow your body to let go and all tension to be released. And again, just taking a very short pause to notice how you're feeling now. All those body sensations. And then just taking your time, doing it with eyes closed if you can, just finding your seat. And finding a comfortable sitting position. So maybe noticing the points of contact between your body and the chair. So allowing your back to rest peacefully against the back of your chair. Your hands on your lap. Pelvis, buttocks supported by the chair, your feet on the ground. In this position, I'm going to invite you to bring to mind just at the end of the day, seeing yourself at the end of the day, maybe taking your dogs for a walk. Let bring, let that come to mind. So if you've got a particular walk you're used to doing with the dogs, so it's just really imagining yourself, visualising yourself in whatever way you can. Taking the dogs, maybe hearing the dogs. And starting this walk seeing yourself and the dogs on the path you're taking, really taking in any details you can capture visually, perhaps, you know, where the vegetation that's around you, the colours, the shapes, maybe the weather, 
if you look at the sky, look at your dogs, what they're doing on the path, are they're running, are they're waiting for you, just you know, the usual thing. Really focusing on the visual elements, also the sounds, what you can hear, any natural sounds you can pick up. Sounds of your dogs barking. Really attentive to any sounds around you. And perhaps also feeling the ground from which you're walking. Anything you can feel, touch, maybe the wind on your face, the air, any smell, any fragrance you can pick up on. So really using all your senses as if you were there now, as if you were taking your dogs for a walk right now, being there. And really enjoying this moment. Noticing what you like, like about this particular moment with your dogs, about the walk, about the place. And then very slowly I'm going to invite you just to let that image fade away and come back to your body, maybe keeping any positive feelings or sensations you might have experienced. And we're just going to take a few seconds for a final pause, just to notice and absorb the effects of the short practice. Really noticing how you're feeling now. Are you feeling physically, mentally? Really, really being curious as to how you're feeling with no judgment. See your breath. And then very slowly, we're going to come back to the room. So before you open your eyes, I invite you to you just move your body in whichever way feels right, maybe stretching, just introducing some movement to your body, maybe breathing a bit more deeply, just taking your time, no rush to come back fully engaged in the present moment. And when you're ready, you can come back and open your eyes. Very good. Very good indeed. Some really interesting points were raised in this interview, especially when considering how a solo entrepreneur whose talents and businesses seem to be centred around the relationship that Sandrine makes with others. So how can this scale? Well, in situations like this, I also think of the meditation app Headspace. What started as a small selection of people benefiting from the experience and skill of Andy Pendicombe has grown into a global network of people making guided meditation part of their daily routine. And there's no reason why Sandrine can't use her skill and experience with sophology to grow her business similarly. I look forward to seeing her business grow. Now, let's hear a conversation between James and Leah Hollywood from White Bicycles. Absolutely delighted to be talking to Leah Holroy today. And it's really just to kind of get a flavour of her journey, what she's doing, and let's look at towards the future and sort of pick up on some of those, those things. So welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So I just want to kind of start with a little bit about your kind of enthusiasms and passions, because I think you did languages at, uh, at Cambridge. Is that right? I did. Oh, background checks. Yeah, I did. <laughs> What's the, the thing about languages that really excites you and makes you sort of kind of really interested about that? Do you know, I, I think the reason I chose languages was because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. You know, I had friends at school who had a real clear sense of you know they wanted to be a doctor they wanted to be a lawyer they had this path in mind I really wasn't sure at all and I think I thought languages it's a way of keeping my options open it's a way of studying lots of different things and getting a practical skill and kind of yeah opening up some possibilities so as part of my degree I studied history, um, social topics, linguistics, all sorts of different things. Okay. Um, so in terms of kind of education and learning in general, this is something which has been 
embedded in you from the, from a young person right to where you are today? Both my parents are teachers or were teachers. They're retired now. And, you know, my mum was a primary school teacher. She worked in my primary school at times. So often I would be there sort of helping her or sitting with her while she marked books or prepared for lessons, staying after school while, while she sort of wrapped things up and talked to other teachers. So I was always in that sort of environment where, you know, my parents would be talking about school and education. And I toyed with the idea of becoming a teacher myself. You know, I looked into teacher training. I spent about 18 months working in a primary school. I loved it in a way, you know, it was it was, it was kind of, it was super rewarding work. I was doing a lot of one-to-one with children with special educational needs. And I sort of loved it, but it was exhausting and it needed so much energy and so much passion. And it, it just didn't qu- quite feel like the right fit for me. So I had this sense that I wanted to do something related to education, but maybe not, you know, standing at the front of a class trying to, you know, keep 30 kids kind of under control. So in that ilk, is it this desire to help others fulfill what they're sort of doing? Is that some kind of driving area around this and if so where where do you think that nurturing element came from it feels sort of obvious or inevitable to me that it's it's the right thing to do to try and have a positive impact on people's lives but i'll i'll be completely honest when my brother and i started white bicycle we did not start it with the aim of kind of transforming lives we didn't have that amazing vision i think that came later we started to to work on projects we realized that there was that possibility that we we could actually change people's lives for the better through education and training. And the more we started to see that, the more we thought, actually, yeah, this is this is what we're about. This is what we're doing. Part of it was luck. Part of it was certain projects coming along. But it's been, a, I suppose, a sort of snowball effect. The more that these projects have come to us with these amazing positive impacts, the more we've decided to make that our mission and to go after them and to promote our, ourselves as a company that's, you know, that's really trying to give something back, I suppose. Sometimes those sorts of things emerge as we get work and sometimes we recognise, don't we, that that's not a customer I actually want to work with, but this is a customer I'd love to work with. And it's that kind of realisation. I'm also intrigued about the, the the brother and sister side of it because have, having siblings, well, a sibling as well, which is a sister, it's always there's always a challenge in life about working with your siblings and and partners. So, was that did that feel a very natural progression into the biz- world of business? I think it's quite a marmite thing. When I tell people that I run a business with my brother, I get one of two reactions: people either go, "Oh, that's amazing, that's so lovely," or they go, "Oh no, 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 no! Why, why would you do that to yourself? Why would you put yourself through it?" Again, it it wasn't necessarily the plan starting out. My brother Finn is 10 years younger than me. So I'd already got a few years work under my belt by the time he graduated. And at the point where he finished uni, I was working as a freelancer. Freelancing was going well. There was quite a lot of demand for my services. If anything, there was a bit more than I could really take on on my own. So he graduated, wasn't entirely sure what he wanted to do. He thought he might want to be an accountant. And I was thinking, you'd hate being an accountant. But, you know, I didn't want to be the the big, annoying older sister who knows, you know, who knows what's best for him. So I sort of said, well, look, while you're applying for these graduate schemes in accountancy, why don't you pitch in and give me a hand with some of this freelance work? You know, even though you're kind of new to it, there are definitely some tasks that you could pick up and help with. So he started doing that. And um Neither of us thought that it would be a long-term thing, but it just seemed to work. We got on really well. He had a kind of natural knack for for this kind of work. The clients loved it because suddenly, you know, I was able to deliver more quickly or take more on. So it just seemed to be working. And I think we probably freelanced kind of side by side for 18 months, two years, something like that. And, and, you know, and then at that point, you look back and think, and came maybe we're onto something here you know this is this is more than a temporary fix and all ideas of accountancy sort of went out the window at that point um and we decided to to sort of make it official and and form a company together so presumably then you found that you were complementing each other's skills and complementing the way you were working and so where do you see your strengths and where do you see Finn's strengths so you're right. That was something that was quite nice. When when we first started working together, I was sort of training him up more on the learning design side of things. So, you know, 
coming up with ideas for interactivity to build into online courses, that type of thing. But it soon became clear that actually, although he hadn't worked in online education before, he'd done video work. So things like filming, video editing, audio editing, he already had some experience and he was good at those things and he wanted to do them. That's not my cup of tea at all, quite frankly. You know, I'll I'll leave that to the professionals. So what we've tried to do is to get to a point where if one of us was, you know, is sick or is on holiday, the other person can pretty much cover their role. So we've got that flexibility. But equally, we've, we have got our own sort of specialties. So while he's more on the t- technical side and the multimedia, I do a lot more of the, the client facing stuff, project management and that side of things. And then we'll both be building courses. That's quite nice. That seems to work quite well for us. And I think it's a perpetual challenge, isn't it? Because we we often meet people who are in business who are independently in business and they're a one-man band or they're they're looking at maybe contractors or working externally. And we always encourage people to look towards their networks and to to who they are in order that they can find these co-travellers on this particular journey. And I think it's really Mm -hmm. important. And sometimes the one area that we don't necessarily look to sort of kind of hard into is the immediate family. In terms of motivations, going back to some of the drivers around the way that you've approached your career, it sounds quite, even from the point of view of the way you defined choosing your course at university, because there was a mapped out career for some, but you were still in that area. Is it important for you to be that flexible in your thinking as well, to be adaptable to those situations? Definitely. When I look back on my career so far, there has been very little in the way of a plan (laughs) at any point. It's been very much about often just saying yes to opportunities as they come along. It is really important to me to have an open mind, um, not to assume where I'm going to be in a year's time or in five years time, but to be really open to what life presents. And that's part of the fun, really. You know, it takes you in in sometimes unexpected directions. For example, I I worked in London for about four years um, for a startup. And they worked with universities around the world. One of their customers was a a university in Australia. And I met with the director of teaching and learning there, may have hinted that I was thinking about moving on to something new. And he offered me a job. He said, well, why don't you come to Australia and and work with me? You know, I've, I've got this position that I think you'd be good for. And I'd never dreamed of moving to Australia. You know, it hadn't occurred to me at all. And I, I just said, yeah, okay. Fine. And I went and did that for about 18 months. And lots of friends and family said to me, oh, we'll never see you again. People move to Australia and they never come back. Um, So this is it kind of thing. But I did it for 18 months and then circumstances changed and I came back to the UK. None of that was planned. But I, I, yeah, that's that's that is important to me. Um, Just just going with the flow, I suppose. Do you think it's when you look around you now and you see the generations of it, do you think there is still that level of opportunity seeking do you do you think people are willing to say yes to opportunities like that more and more some people definitely like the safety and security i mean it's a bit like people who go into business versus people who go into employment again i have people who who sort of say to me oh you're so lucky you're your own boss i'd love to do it and other people who say good on you but it's really not for me and they hate the all of the uncertainty around how much money's coming in how much time they need to spend I think anyone can be an entrepreneur. I don't think everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. And that's, you know, that's obviously fine. Living with that kind of ambiguity, is, it can be a real challenge, can't it? I mean, in terms of yeah. that, you know, security of cash flow from a job perspective is great. But is that something that took you a while to adjust to? Or did that freelance style introduced you to it at an early age and, and moved it forward? Yeah, it is there. It's, you know, we've been going as a limited company for four years now. and there is it's still there, you know, it's always at the back of my mind of sort of how much is coming in and can we afford our expenses and things. I'm not sure that will ever go away, but I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, I've got used to that. I do find it interesting. I mean, I'm about to contradict myself completely, but people see full-time employment as the safe, secure option. But the the flip side of that is that things are, are usually out of your hands. They're out, they're out of your control. Whereas it's within my control 
to go out and get more business. You know, it might not be easy, but I, I can do that. In a full-time job, you could be you could be made redundant. You could be fired. You know, there are all kinds of things that could, could go wrong. While I was freelancing, one of my clients offered me an employed position and the salary that they offered me was really quite low, I thought, for what I'd be doing. And when I raised that with them, they said, oh, but it's the security. That should be attractive. But for me, the security, if there is security, the security comes from having multiple clients. If one of my clients has issues, has challenges, can't afford to, you know, maybe doesn't pay on time, which happens quite a lot. The buffer, ideally, is that you've got other clients that you're working with. You're not putting all your eggs in one basket, right? That's what that's what it comes down to, I think. Again, when I always meet people and they say, oh, I've got a really good client that's this, that and the other. And you you have to kind of, like you say, weigh up that security from the diversity of your, A, I think your client base, but B, your business models as well. So that you're not relying just on simply one business model. You're thinking about how do I create an ecosystem of business models using and utilizing what we have, which I always think is a great challenge in business, but I also think it's one of the great creative forces in business is where as an entrepreneur, you're always asking yourself really relevant questions about what's the next step? What do I need to be doing to make this resilient, to build some form of stability into the process, but at the same time, allow for exploration and opportunity seeking and doing all of those different things. So if you had to kind of describe um, the values of White Bicycle, say the core values of White Bicycle, how, how would you describe that? We've already talked about the the sort of social impact side of things uh, a little bit. That is really important to us. Like I said, that's that's become more and more important to us as we've sort of seen what's possible. We've been really fortunate to work on some some brilliant projects. Just recently wrapped up work on a project for the United Nations World Food Programme, which is working with a fantastic organisation called Diversity and Ability. Um, And with them, we've created a a suite of online modules all around disability inclusion and disability confident leadership. Those modules are going out to, I think it's over 23,000 people all around the world who are working for the UNWFP. And that feels huge, especially two-person team. We work with a couple of freelancers as well, but basically a two-person team sitting in our little home offices, you know, in Essex. It's amazing to think that something we've created is going to have that kind of reach. We've worked on courses for healthcare professionals, you know, doctors and nurses treating people with cancer, trying to make sure that the patient experience is as positive as it can be. Um, We've worked with the British Ecological Society, training young people to think more about their environment, impacts on their environment and things. So that positive impact, even though we're, you know, we're perhaps a small part of a, a much bigger picture, That's the sort of thing that gets us out of bed in the morning, quite frankly. And then I think in terms of the way that we work, it's values like openness and transparency and integrity. So in a way, it doesn't sound like much, but when a client comes to us, we want them to feel that they can trust us, that we will actually do what we say we're going to do. We will deliver on time. We will deliver on budget. If for any reason, you know, something comes up we will we will talk to them about it so we'll communicate really effectively really openly as a result I think we have really positive relationships with our clients which again I love and it was kind of a surprise when we set up the business because it's all about online it's you know it's all digital I thought that the focus would be very much on the output if you see what I mean whereas when we get feedback from customers at the end of a project they'll say you know great courses Love the user experience, um, really well designed, but also the the thing that they're most sort of effusive about is they say, we've loved working with you. We've we've really enjoyed collaborating with you, you know, your communication, et cetera, et cetera. So actually those relationships, I suppose the the person-centered kind of approach is really important as well. So let's just talk a little bit about the actual kind of design of the courses and things that you Mm. put together. You spoke about the cancer treatment and making sure they have the best experience. Is that directed to the person with cancer that you are helping them understand their condition better? Or is that one kind of approach that you're... It, it can be. We've, we've done a little bit of patient education uh, stuff, but more, more often it's aimed at the healthcare professionals. So doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, helping them to develop their clinical skills but also their skills in working with patients you know communicating 
Things like having conversations with patients about their treatment, having end of life conversations where that's necessary. It's partly clinical, but it's partly sort of the, you know, the transferable skills, that kind of thing. So this is quite broad areas of work, aren't they? And so is it you designing the content that puts them in or are you structuring the kind of learning that goes into it? So usually what happens is the client supplies the content. So, for example, we'd work with an NHS trust and they would have their in-house experts, you know, experienced doctors, nurses, etc., who can draft some, they can draft a Word doc or put together some PowerPoint slides that cover the key points that they think people need to know on whatever topic it is. And our role then is to to take that uh, that raw content and turn it into something that's online, interactive, multimedia, in a way that is hopefully going to engage people. It's going to give them opportunities to check their understanding, to put what they've learned into practice, and hopefully it's going to be memorable and actually going to affect their behaviour in the workplace. That's interesting. So presumably then you are from a educational, I guess a pedagogy or something in that line, you are designing the, the the structure of this, the way people might approach the learning themselves, though not the content itself, that comes from the customer. Where do you see maybe some of the, um, the future developments in terms of that? Because I would imagine that there must be more kind of immersive technologies and more kind of things coming into the learning environment. And are you readily looking at those kind of technologies? Are there the things like that that could modify or change or improve the dynamics of your learning experience? We always try and, and keep up to date with, with new educational technology. As you say, there's there's always something new on the horizon. We have a fairly tried and tested approach to course building that we we tend to use. Obviously, within that, there's variation. You know, it's all bespoke. It's all tailored to the client and their audience and, and so on. So we might use different elements. You know, sometimes we'll use more video, sometimes we'll use more animation. We sometimes build in more immersive things. So things like interactive scenarios. Part of our USP is that we're offering something for a certain kind of budget. When we started the company, it seemed that there was a gap in the market. At one end, there were companies churning out these generic off-the-shelf interactive modules on things like health and safety and you know sort of compliance topics and taking this one size fits all approach at the other end of the spectrum there were companies charging a huge amount of money for completely bespoke you know custom solutions designed from scratch all singing all dancing and actually i think there was a i think there was and still is a, a gap an opportunity for organizations that don't have unending funds to throw at something but they want some training that's interactive and engaging and that's tailored to their organization if we cast our mind back to december 22 and standing in december 23 are you happy with the progress that white bicycle has made and during the course of 23 were there any opportunities that you feel may have kind of either passed you by or that you would love maybe in retrospect to have explored in more detail? I think 2023 has been a really challenging year for a lot of businesses. For example, earlier this year, I I took part in the NatWest Business Accelerator program. I was part of the London cohort. There were about 100 businesses who were selected to take part. And it was a six-month program. And I noticed over the course of this program that there seemed to be Every every time we met up for a workshop, there were slightly fewer people in the room. And eventually, at the end of the program, I said to someone, you know, is it just me or are people <laughs> not bothering to turn up anymore? And he said, well, actually, you know, some of the businesses that were in the cohort have gone bust since we started. And when you think that those are companies that were selected by NatWest, you know, they've gone through a process, they've been interviewed and applied and all the rest of it. The fact that they haven't been able to to sort of weather 2023, I think, is is quite telling. And when I speak to friends who own businesses, that there's a lot of uncertainty. There seems to be a lot less money around. I think we've had a good year in the circumstances. We've picked up some new clients, which has been amazing. It's been a slightly slower year than the last year and the year before, definitely. It's very easy as an entrepreneur, especially if you're working alone, working from home 
to end up in a bubble and to forget about you know what's going on in the in the big wide world and actually i think in the sort of economic climate that we have at the moment i think we have had a good year i'd like to have an even better year in 2024 if possible you know i'm, I'm not going to deny that but um actually probably around in december 22 finn and i were talking really seriously about hiring our first employees and we started to draft a job advert and you know various things we sort of started to take the first few steps and actually in maybe spring this year we spoke to a mentor from the recruitment industry who said if i were you i wouldn't you know until you're absolutely certain until you genuinely have so much work that you you can't physically do it all yourselves i would wait i would hold back that was quite a contrast to other conversations i had where there was a lot of especially if you're doing things like accelerators there's obviously emphasis on growth you know and rapid growth and everyone gets very excited about rapid growth but i am so glad that we didn't hire anyone this year that would have been really challenging and I'm not sure how that would have panned out at all. You know, I know people who've had to let staff go this year because they can't afford to pay them. And I'm so thankful that we didn't end up in that situation. We did a piece the other week on engaging with the university from the point of view of interns and placements. Mm -hmm. And our kind of philosophy is, is that what you end up doing is farming your talent pool as opposed to going out and looking to a hire within that particular mm -hmm. framework. So what you end up with is you end up with short-term contracts, which are great spaces to learn your and develop your own leadership style and your own processes and platforms, because they are just as that you would do with any employee, go through that mm -hmm. particular process. But at the same time, it allows you to keep that flow of talent moving through your business so that when you are in that particular space of growth and growth opportunity, it's an option. It's not necessarily the option or whatever, but it, it is an option to lean back into the town pool and go, was there somebody there that we could actually yep. move forward and that is available for us to be able to do that? Um, because one of the challenges that we see with recruitment, and I kind of did this throughout my entire career, is that when things are going really, really well in a particular industry and the industry is really hot, then talent is really scarce and very highly priced. Yep. And what businesses then tend to do is they tend to reach for that talent pool. They tend to overpay and keep that talent pool yeah. kind of elevated. And the problem with that is, is that that then obviously impacts your own liquidity, your own management of your cash and the like. Whereas what we yep. used to do in, in London when we were developing businesses where, where we were working is keep those talent pools going with school placements, summer to summer interns, holiday jobs, all the rest of it. So that we then started, when they went through their universities, the internships that came back, the placements, the kind of final graduate schemes that they all came into were people that are actually already immersed in the business and knew what we were all about. And it was just a great process. And it's one that I think we don't, invest enough time thinking about within, you know, our own growth trajectory. And I agree with you about growth as well, that there is this, let's go out there and explosive growth and blitz the blitz the market and do all of that kind of stuff. But in reality, we have to enjoy the journey and we have to reflect because it's a learning process, the whole thing. So mm -hmm. it's a reflective avenue when we build businesses. And it's great that if we can build them and learn at the same time, and yeah, there will be levers of growth that we'll go for, but we want to do that when we're in that particular mindset and we think, yep, that's it. We're building something which has got legs. That value proposition can go from one to 10 without any real kind of effort in that process. Yep. And that's when we really want to kind of move it forward. If at the end of 2024 in December, you look back and you said, I'm so glad that we achieved this, what would that be? I've had a couple of quite positive conversations with a possible new client who okay. might be looking to work with us early next year. I won't say who they are or anything, no. um, but all I'll say is that they're in the sports industry. I'll admit I'm I'm not a huge sports person, but Finn is football mad and basically likes any kind of live sport he'll get excited about. He'll stay up and watch the Grand Prix at, at stupid hours, depending on where it is in the world. I know for a fact that if he were here and he could land this particular client, I think he would be really, really chuffed with that. 
So perhaps picking up some new clients um, in in some industries that we haven't worked with before, um, I think would would help to keep things fresh and and help to keep sort of motivation up. I'll sort of kind of finish off, if you don't mind, with just a few kind of rapid fire questions. They're kind of more about you and whatever, but they don't, don't, nothing too personal. But um, uh, we'll start out with um, the first one, which is recent TV series or box set that you've really enjoyed? I just finished watching Bodies. Ooh. which is a kind of time travel murder mystery type thing. It's quite hard to describe exactly what it is, but um, it's brilliant. So, yeah, you should all you should all check that out. It's based on a, a graphic novel, I think. Favourite musician uh, or artist? I always go back to Bell and Sebastian. I've seen them live quite a few times at, at gigs and festivals, and I, I just love them. Your chosen meal on your birthday? Okay, I'm going to go for, I, I think, something slow-cooked. I'm thinking a tagine, like a really good lamb tagine, something like that. Yeah, Very good. Excellent. Much appreciate your time. Thank you for being part of the podcast. That's really cool. Oh, it's been really good fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been no great. Take good care, Lee. Right. How interesting was that to position yourself between cookie cutter solutions, which may be very cost effective, but not tailored completely to your needs. And then the complete bespoke solutions, which may be outside of most people's budgets. Interesting insights. Now, a quick look back at an event I attended at the Colchester Arts Centre. On the 28th of November 2023, I was invited to attend a celebration of young local talent at the historic Colchester Arts Centre. It was run by the underdog crew who had support from the Weave previously. And what struck me about this event was how the underdog crew supported young people to express their creativity, to tell their stories utilising audio and video, having people talk about their differences and how they find strength. The art centre is the perfect place to have this sort of event and the love and support were abundant throughout the evening. We also had the premiere of the series called The Slip, which is the story of a young girl who just doesn't conform. Check that out online if you're interested. One of the stars afterwards just said it's important for people to look after each other, which seems to be a good position to take. There was also an awards night and the winner of the short film award was Mirror You, Mirror Me by Eva Jones, which was a film about social anxiety. So a great evening and I encourage you all to check out the work done by the underdog crew. It does make me proud that the Weave could support their work within the local community. Now we've got our final conversation of the episode and this time around James is talking to Rachel Richards from Uniform 7 about the unique way in which she approaches making uniforms and workwear that are both cost effective and accessible. In this next interview, I'm truly delighted to be talking to a Sen mum, an advocate for neurodiversity, an entrepreneur addressing the needs of young people and the century issues that many of these people face in their daily lives. Rachel Elizabeth Richards is the founder and the CEO of Uniform 7 and The Smart Project, and we're absolutely delighted to have you here with us. So welcome, Rachel. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks, James, for having me. No, no problem at all. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the journey, uh, how where we came from and what we've got to at this particular point, and some of those things in that journey that maybe really were the catalysts for this process, the things at the end of the day that have driven you to this particular point. So where did it all start for you? I was employed by Barking and Devon Council for 10 years, and I managed a small uniform shop there. It was part of the building schools for the uh, future project where they utilise buildings for the community out of hours when the schools weren't using them. So it made sense to put that kind of provision that other parents could use. And it started off just setting it up for a secondary school that was on the site. And by the time I left, well, 10 years later, we had 10 primary schools all together. So it wasn't just the school that was on the site that could make could benefit from the building. It was the local community and other schools as well. And that was interesting, although I didn't have full responsibility. We had a finance department, which definitely signifies one of my weak spots nowadays, running my own business. It's not my best strength. We had senior management just taking care of the premises and things like that. So all I had to do was manage the stock, the customers and um, extra staffing for the busy summer months. 
So I really enjoyed it there and I learned a lot and I learned all my customer facing skills in that role. The customer facing stuff that you do, did that get you involved with schools as well as parents and things like that? Or was was it just really in the business to business side at that stage? Yeah, definitely. It covered both areas, which is something that stays with me now in my role as a founder. So we have to create a service that meets the needs of the schools and ticks all of their boxes with what they're looking for in a uniform supplier. And then when we're working with the parents, it's about adapting the marketing approach to to appeal to them, to make them help them make a good choice, choose what they need, get the sizes that they want. So it's two very different marketing approaches and strategies but in the end it's the same product that we're selling i think you're absolutely right i think that's the the crux it's the same product but it's very different in the way that you approach people and and at that particular stage were you also kind of aware more of what some of the families were experiencing about clothing and various things like that or did that come later on in your sort of kind of journey No, I would say when I was in my role there, it was in a really um, diverse community. So I saw other needs in the market, like um, having to make sure that our marketing was very um, strong imagery because lots of people, English wasn't their first spoken language and they didn't know how to communicate what they were looking for with us. So I came up with the idea about creating a visual brochure so they could just point at the pictures And they would describe the school logos they were looking for by their colours because that was the easiest thing for them to recognise. Moving on to where I'm working now when it comes to the SMART project and the needs there, that came purely from lived experience with my son and going through that journey. I'd only just been running the business for a year and we found that he had autism and then that presented some sensory challenges and suddenly it just clicked for me that there was nothing in the schoolware industry that met the needs of these children. And with myself being ADHD, I just had to find a solution for the problem and come up with something that would fill that gap in the market. That sort of journey towards that and using life experiences to guide where we are and what we're doing is really a common theme, I think, about people particularly who are involved in socially driven businesses and businesses which have got a real output, a real sort of kind of sense of purpose. You left that kind of area of East London and you came over to the Essex area. What was your sort of kind of ambitions in that first initial stage when you moved over here? Did you have the idea for Uniform 7? Did you have that, this is where I want to be kind of process or did it still just kind of emerge through? Yeah, I suppose we were still kind of in startup mode at that point, about two and a half, nearly three years old. So my in my vision was, OK, I'm moving to a new area. I've got a whole geographical location to cover. Uh, there wasn't much competition in the area to worry about. And I was coming with a new approach. So I was confident that we were going to grow. But it actually went the total opposite to what I anticipated. My existing customers didn't like paying postage or shopping online. They got used to me hand delivering their orders, which is something that I couldn't maintain as a grown business owner. And it was really difficult, actually, when we first moved. I also came here with a bigger premises, so still working from home, but a lot more space and the capacity to be able to grow. But there were lots of other obstacles stopping me from doing that. And then we had COVID, so that was kind of the icing on the cake. But we just about survived and came out of it. And that allowed me that time to really focus on the smart project needs and confirm that that is the direction that we're going down in that enforced break from COVID gave you that opportunity to kind of really work on the project in your in your mind and develop what you want this project to achieve. Did it change much in that time? Um, I think that it probably made me think more from an entrepreneurial perspective that it has the potential to grow into something really, really big and that it is going to be the first in the UK. And I've got to start to think about the scope and what I need to put in place to be able to achieve that because it's a huge, huge task. And I always say to everyone, like, I'm just little on me behind my computer and I don't really know what the plan is. I'm going on the journey, but it just highlighted that it is something that's needed and it's not just going to be for a few people here and there and my son. It's a much wider need in the community and the social aspect of it. So it actually needs um, stronger foundations to make sure uh, we can get it where it needs to be. 
So just tell me a little bit about the kind of issues that your product is addressing and how you arrived at this particular solution. So our smart project is to design and manufacture a collection of school uniform with specific features for children with sensory and physical disabilities. So I realised that there was a need for this in the market with my son who's autistic and got high sensory needs and he didn't like wearing the clothes that we put him in every day. He would come home and get changed straight away, often running around the house naked after school. A lot of autistic children do this too. He only liked his pyjamas and I just thought if he's that uncomfortable in his clothing, how is he going to go to school and learn? And then in our early days of research, we've had older children share their thoughts And people have said to us, you know, walking with normal socks, it's like having glass in their shoe. And wearing a school blazer at secondary age, it's like being wrapped in sandpaper. And when I've got young children and teenagers using those sorts of descriptions, it really highlighted to me the the size of the problem and the need for us to fill in the gaps. So I've kind of done done a lot more research, spoke to customers, went out in the field. We've been to hundreds of send coffee mornings and said, what is it that your child struggles with? And that's when I realised it's not just sensory. There are the physical disabilities that are affected as well. What would they be? What would those other physical things be? One of the things I did in the research stage was uh, make a cardigan for a little girl who had meningitis when she was a baby and she lost half of her arm. So now she's just got a stump on her left side. So her mum came to me when I first put the smart project out there and said, how can we help? She said to me, what can you do for my daughter? And I said, what, what, what is it that she needs? Why is the current uniform not suitable? So just something as simple as um, shortening the sleeve on a cardigan, we couldn't reuse the cuff that it came with because the circumference of it was much smaller than at the top of your arm. Like for ourselves, if we pull our sleeves up, we can't get the cuff all of the way because it's too tight. It's too much elastic in that part. So just something as simple as that made that garment really uncomfortable for that little girl. And then there's other elements to think about, like the skin is very fragile on those areas because it is an amputated limb. We have to take care of that, make sure that it's moisturised and they don't want rough fabrics rolled up and, and irritating that throughout the day. So what we did for that little girl was shorten the sleeve, made a new cuff out of an old scrap jumper And we replaced all of the buttons down the front with magnetic so that she was able to fasten them with her one hand. So that that would be a custom made um, adaption. That's a physical adaption rather than a sensory one. Yeah, we sort of kind of take for granted that everything is consistent, isn't it? But it's not, is it? We're we're all different shapes. And if you've got a physical disability like cerebral palsy and your body is twisted in a particular way, it's going to be really uncomfortable putting you into a straight sort of kind of environment or or whatever. So Yeah, absolutely. You're in Essex, but you're doing this nationally as well, aren't you? You our collection will be available nationally. Our goal is to get it into every special needs school in the country. Our USP is that we provide the branding as well, which to me makes the product fully inclusive. But there is some logistics to try and figure out how we can do that uh, cost effectively, because if we're only supplying one child in one school, it can work out quite expensive to apply branding. And we've got to think about the communication and the permission side of it to deal with the schools to be able to replicate their logos. Perhaps opportunities for partners and people like that who are in the printing and the Uh, garment production industries that are looking at it and thinking of it from the point of view of their corporate social responsibility some aspect of what they're trying to in what they're doing so tell me so tell me a little bit more about the shop that you've opened because i know that look really amazing that kind of vision of where that that is that something that you want to kind of replicate as well around the country i haven't thought so much about shop facility but i have thought about franchising our approach because it is going to need to be offered across the country and to maintain the level of service that we're planning on offering here we do you do need that physical presence and parents will need the one-to-one support so we're here at the sunspot which is brand new building it's absolutely fantastic It, it looks amazing we're right by the sea um, it's all the facilities are brilliant. It's got an energy rating A, which also ticks our sustainability goals and boxes. And that was something that was really important to me when I was looking for a new premises because I didn't want to disregard that and make sure that where we selected was suitable. 
So I'm glad that we're here. I'm here now today just doing the last bits of painting ready for the stock on the machinery to arrive later this week. And the plan is to, we've created like a tray counter area in the front because in our industry in uniform, there's thousands of products and sizes and colours. We could possibly stock everything. So it's not the sort of thing that we can have a shop where people can come in and browse. It's very much speaking to them on a one-to-one -one basis, asking what they're looking for, what their business is, what their school is, what colours they want, what type of uniform, and we can provide them the service they need in that way instead. And we'll also be offering one-to-one -one fitting appointments for those children with disabilities to come in and to be sized up properly if they need to in a private and a quiet setting that's accommodating for them. Oh, that's really, that's excellent. So it's almost like a, a in my mind, I've almost got it like a factory come retail outlet come community hub for people who, uh, you know, there it's a safe space. It's It delivers everything that you, you know, you're aiming to deliver in that area. And I think that idea of either trying to find the model that can replicate that, whether it's franchise or whether it's you kind of putting it into the next sort of area. Again, if you think of it kind of like the Apple growth model, whereby they the Apple stores became this amazing sort of experience for people and if you create something which is yeah equally as enjoyable and engaging it can be some kind of an experience that people will ultimately feel privileged to be in my initial vision is that people would travel from quite far to come and see us because it is our only outlet and with the type of service that we're offering where it's inclusive and adaptive there isn't anything else around so I am hopeful that people will come from far to visit us and to get those products initially. In the early days, it's very much our workspace. All of the branding and the stock will be held here and orders will be dispatched from here. People have said to me quite recently that we will outgrow this room quite quickly. But my plan is to keep it because it is my first front facing shop. And for every entrepreneur, we, I've always wanted to have a window to dress, you know. So I don't want to be come in and out of here as a stopgap very quickly. But I'll always retain it as a front facing premises because it just looks so nice. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Where do you see the future of the smart project? Because it is a huge, huge marketplace potentially for you to work. Looking at the growth opportunities that it presents that the first thing we have to do is get the recipe right get the features of our collection right and make sure that we're not um, wasting money and investment on running manufacturing lines um, that maybe the products are not quite as good as they can be so we're still in that early product development phase once we've got the products right the natural progression in my eyes would be to expand the size range and push that into the workwear market because there is nothing of this kind in the workwear market at all. Yeah. Schoolwear, little minimal competition from some of the high street retailers, but again, not to the specification that we're going to work to. And then the other side of it for me and the growth is to develop the inclusive work environment because I want to be able to put this model out there and show that it's run by a team of inclusive staff. I'm still working on that. There's still a lot to learn in that area. And I'm learning how to manage that level of disability in the workplace, understanding people's strengths and how those strengths convert into skills that are useful in the workplace. But if I can get the recipe right to say that these are the types of people that can work in certain roles in the business and then we've got our products that meet the same audience and everybody shares that lived experience and that understanding that is my vision for it and obviously the goal initially is to to be the number one sensory and adaptive schoolware retailer in the UK. That idea of an inclusive workforce that's representative of your the, the people that you're working with that is an important aspect of your overall vision within the business. Yes, definitely. It's, I think it's key to, to separate ourselves from the competitors. And also, I take it uh, as my own personal responsibility to show that it can work. It is challenging. It's extremely challenging. And you've got to persevere with it. But every now and again, the match will happen. It's, it's like with anyone's employment, really. Some jobs we like, some jobs we don't like. But we just go to them because we have to. But I think with inclusive employment, you've got to match somebody's strengths and their skills to what is their zone of genius. And yeah. if you get the match right, you will get so much benefit from them in return. I like that expression a lot. Zone of genius. What a good, what a good expression. <laughs> 
So yeah, yeah. Been lots of people around me, my coaches and, and support is something that we talk about a lot, utilising our zone of genius. My zone of genius is being an entrepreneur and creating solutions to problems that I come across because that's how I thrive. So when I'm looking at my staff, again, somebody who's maybe on reception, their zone of genius has to be in communication because they've got to be there ready, welcoming and there to fulfil that role. So when I say I'm still trying to figure it out, this is what it's about, is learning how to match someone's needs and someone's skills, regardless of their disability. But it might stop them from doing one role, but there'll always be another role out there which they'll excel at. So if you had to offer somebody, maybe a neurodiverse challenge of some description, but ultimately somebody that is thinking about what do they should be doing for their life and they want to maybe explore the entrepreneurial world what would you say to them what would you do say to them that would encourage them to think about this particular journey i would say to do some kind of what analysis or a model like that where they can sit and think about what their strengths and weaknesses are what they like doing what they don't like doing start to think about industries that they're interested in and if they can find a personal connection or something that they're passionate about try to focus and go down that journey and that's where they're going to have the most success because they'll enjoy coming to work every day. Yeah, no, brilliant. It's really good advice. The only other sort of kind of area maybe that I want to just touch on at this particular point is what are you kind of now looking for, right, in terms of resources to get you to the next level? We've got some roles open to be able to make it work here, um, having a new premises and a new shop, because obviously I can't be here every day as much as I would love to. I just can't. So I'm looking for a receptionist and some help for my productions team, which is going to be in the form of more than one person. So we're going to build a pool of neurodiverse staff that can come in and specialise in different areas and they'll have a job that's specifically assigned to them. And then I think, obviously, funding and investment and financial support to be able to get the collection through manufacture. We are working with Innovate UK already, which has been fantastic. And I'm looking forward to seeing what opportunities come up from there. We may be going abroad next year to explore some of the manufacturing markets abroad over in Asia. I'm really excited about that. And just start to think about the the bigger picture and know that we've got the foundations are here. We've clearly identified the needs and we've got to fill in the gaps really to get to 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 get it off the ground properly. Excellent. So next question then, how can people find you? What's the best place that they can contact you if they need, if they can fulfil some aspect of that? Yeah, so we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram. Obviously now we've got the shop, which I'm just going through the process of verifying on Google. That's not easy. Um, So you can come in and see see me or one of my staff. Someone will be here every day. All, all the usual socials and obviously our website has got a contact form onto uniform7.co.uk. Okay, just um, finish off with just a few kind of rapid fire questions, which I like to put to people at this particular stage. Favourite band or, or musician? Robbie Williams. Oh, excellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Last book you read that you enjoyed and recommend? The Millionaire Clown by James Sinclair. Excellent. Favourite box set or film? I'm not really a film person, so I'd probably choose something like Little Rascals from my childhood. (laughs) And also the final one is, uh, what would be your favourite meal on your birthday? Probably like prawn cocktail with salad. Excellent. Something fresh. Something fresh. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel, for your time. And that's a really good conversation. Thank you, James. And just a reminder, if you want to visit the physical store that can be found in Jaywick, and for more information, you can just go to their website, uniform7, that's the numeral 7, .co.uk. And how great is it to have somebody like Rachel in our area working to make uniforms and workwear more accessible? I wish her all the success. So that closes out another episode of Interwoven from the Weave. We hope you've enjoyed the conversations. I want to say thank you to all who have participated. 
As a reminder, The Weave has a free community of business owners and learners looking to connect, improve and succeed. There is so much to explore and that can all be found at wearetheweave.co.uk. So I look forward to seeing you there. I've been Adam Roxby and I'll see you in the community.